My name is Rosie Deutschler. I manage the analytics and insights team within the Evidence Centre here at Oranga Tamariki. I've been involved with the children's wellbeing model right from its inception all the way through its development, so that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Uh, the main part of our presentation is really about the health case study that we've done, uh, but this work was done within the children's wellbeing model, so I thought it was important to first give you a bit of a, an overview of the model and a bit of background as to what it is, what it's all about. So before we get started, just another quick piece of housekeeping. This is the Stats NZ disclaimer, which some of you may recognise. Essentially, all it's saying is that we haven't used any individualised data and the findings that you'll see here today are not official statistics. So the children's wellbeing model, what is it? Uh, there are four key elements to the model that I wanted to talk through. Uh, the first is that the children's wellbeing model looks at all children in New Zealand. So as a tool, it's been designed to help um, aid the way that we think about and support all children and the insights we can gather around uh, the children's population as a whole. Uh, secondly, the model focuses on well-being. So, so this is not a surprise, it's called the children's well-being model. Um, but I did just want to emphasise that briefly. The work that we do at Oranga Tamariki every single day is about children. So it's really important to us that we've got a model that reflects that and is child-centred. Thirdly, the model recognises that well-being is complex. So it incorporates a lot of cross-sector data. We can't understand well-being just with our own data, so through the model we're able to draw a lot of data uh, together into one place. And lastly, the model, uh, when we built it, uh, we wanted something that allows us to understand current state well-being, but also something that allows us to look at long-term outcomes as well. So the model allows us to look at the present, but also the future. So how does the model work? Uh, there are three main parts to the model. The first is the conceptual understanding of well-being. And this is really the theoretical backbone to how we use well-being. And you might recognise six outcomes here on the slide. These are from the Child and Youth Wellbeing Strategy. And uh, so the strategy sets out six high-level and interrelated wellbeing outcomes and it also reflects what children and young people have said are important to them. So the first outcome that we've got is that children and young people are loved, safe and nurtured. Uh, then we've got children and young people have what they need, uh, that they are happy and healthy, they are learning and developing, they are accepted, respected and connected and that they are involved and empowered in their own lives. So there's a lot more thought um, below these outcomes and a lot more information so if you are interested in finding out more uh, all this information is available on the child and youth well uh, child and youth well-being strategy website if you did want to know more the second part to the model is how we measure current state well-being so in order to do this, we've built our model within the StatsNZ Integrated Data Infrastructure, uh, most commonly known as the IDI. So for those of you who haven't heard of the IDI before, essentially it's a large resource database. It, it holds microdata about people and about households, and it's mostly about life events, and it brings together data from a number of different sources. So it's linked together, or it's integrated, uh, to form the IDI. And what's really important to note uh, with the IDI is that all the data in there is anonymous, so we can't identify anybody in the IDI. So we've used the IDI to measure wellbeing, and this is based on what we can currently see in there. So our children's wellbeing model is on a continuous journey of improvement, so it's going to continue to change and improve and develop over time as more information is added to the IDI and new information is added to the IDI as well, so that's really, really exciting. <coughs> At the moment, uh, we can measure the first four outcomes. We have done a bit of work on the 
fifth and sixth outcome, but as you can imagine, they're a lot more difficult and complex to measure. So work's still underway in that space. Sitting underneath each of the wellbeing outcomes, we um, have a whole bunch of different indicators which allow us to measure the outcomes. Importantly, these are all proxies. So in the absence of direct measures, we've looked at what's in there that acts as the most valid proxy for what we do want to be measuring. And this is all multi-agency information. So we've got information in there from MSD, we've got information from the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health, uh, Corrections, Police, uh, of course Oranga Tamariki, and a whole bunch of other sources as well. So it's really taking a broad view. Um, yeah, so, so to sum up that part, essentially we're looking at service usage and other indicators of need and of well-being uh, to give us an understanding of what children look like in the context of them, uh, their families and their communities. And in order to do that we also draw on information not only on the children themselves but also on siblings and on parents too. To provide you a couple of more specific examples, I'm not going to go through all of the outcomes but as an example for children and young people have what they need, uh, we can look at information uh, such as benefit receipt, uh, parental income and social housing. For children and young people are happy and healthy, we can look at things such as hospitalisations, immunisations, uh, mental health treatment and a whole bunch more as well. But those are the, the sorts of things that we have available to us. Awesome. So this is a visual demonstration of what the wellbeing of children and young people in New Zealand looks like. Uh, so it pulls together all 0 to 16 year olds in New Zealand and so that's roughly just over a million children and young people. And so using the model what we can do is we can begin to segment what different levels of wellbeing look like. So if we come down to the very right hand side of the arch uh, we've got children who through the data that we can see it looks like they've got very poor well-being so these are the children who are at the very high end of need uh, so that's roughly 10,000 children if we bring it all the way back to the big blue section uh, those are all the children who again from what we can see uh, because there are limitations it looks like they're doing well and so that's 570,000 children and young people and then we've got a bit of a, a spectrum in between. The other interesting way to look at this is if we look at everything that's not in the blue, those are all the children and young people who look like in some shape or form, small or large, uh, they could be doing better. So that's just under half of the population of children in New Zealand. So that's really significant. So that's, you know, that's why we come to work every day and that's that's essentially what it's all about, what we want to improve. Uh, very lastly from me, so I mentioned there were three main parts to the model. The first was the con conceptual understanding of wellbeing. Uh, the second was how we think about and measure current state wellbeing. And the third is around those longer term outcomes. So I'm not going to go into any uh, detail around that, but you will see that play out a bit in the work that we've done uh, with the health information. So I will pass you over to Bridget now uh, to begin talking about that. Thanks Rosie. Kia ora. Um, that's exactly the, the extra thing to say about the IDI. So Rosie mentioned its integrated nature, but another very important feature is um, that it is longitudinal in nature. So we have a lot of information gathered over quite a long period of time, which means we're able to look at uh, a life course. We're actually able to follow people's life courses um, for actually there's um, decades of data in some cases um, available to us. Um, and that was really the key to help us with developing this health case study, which is a key component of the children's model. 
So what we were trying to do in this particular component was try and understand the share of um, some of the key chronic diseases that we see in adult life that could be attributed to uh, poor childhood experiences. Um, just to add to our understanding of the interconnected nature of um, some of those life course outcomes and, um, and understand the impact of childhood experiences on future uh, health outcomes. Uh, part of that was in terms of uh, thinking about some of the bounds we might have on the, the gains possible in the health domain um, from successful interventions in childhood wellbeing. Um, so we did this work in conjunction with the Ministry of Health um, and, and a number of um, expert in, uh, from the ministry and broader health sector, uh, using in addition to the IDI a lot of input from the New Zealand Health Survey and the New Zealand Burden of Disease Study. Um, so we took uh, a four-step approach uh, to determine the expected lifetime impact of childhood um, experiences on health uh, once children reach age 25. So I'll explain the phases because they don't quite go in the chronolo uh, chronological order you might expect. So on the advice of the, the health experts, the first step was to determine the major adolescent risk factors that are associated with um, high morbidity and high cost adult health conditions. And in that sense, the adolescent period was um, this ages 18 to 25. And the, the sort of key conditions that we were looking at were things like uh, long-term uh, mental health uh, support needs, uh, the impact of uh, substance abuse, alcohol and other drugs and smoking, and um, the impact of obesity on uh, future health costs <coughs> such as um, diabetes. Um, there are actually six conditions in all. Um, the other three conditions um, around uh, recurrent infections, um, accidental injuries and sexual and reproductive health. Um, we did look at those, but they contributed a substantially smaller uh, proportion of the overall um, uh, lifetime cost and burden. Um, so having looked at the, uh, the risk factors or the presence of uh, those conditions or the precursors to those conditions in ages 18 to 25, we then went backwards in time to look at the childhood um, experiences of New Zealanders, to look at the association between the risk of developing those conditions in the adolescent period um, across a very wide um, number of factors. So starting from the demographic, so um, you know, gender, um, ethnicity, um, socioeconomic factors, uh, but also specific factors related to um, care and protection experience, exposure to um, family violence um, and the like. And so in that sense, there is some resemblance to um, studies in, uh, that have been done internationally around adverse childhood experiences. This is not a reproduction of an adverse childhood experiences study in full, but certainly the findings were analogous to what you would see um, in, those, in those studies. So we looked at the association between those childhood experiences and the adolescent risk factors. And then we took a step forward and looked forward into what was the uh, expected lifetime burden associated with those um, conditions um, or the risk of those conditions in um, adolescence. And we did that in two ways. Uh, one, we looked at the future disease burden uh, using DALIs, Disability Adjusted Life Years. Um, so we looked at the DALIs associated over the life course um, around mental health, um, obesity uh, and uh, substance abuse as well as the others. And for that, that principal source for that was the burden of disease study. Um, and um, effectively, it was an attribution of what we understand um, around the estimation of DALIs um, to 
the components that could be attributed to um, early life. And separately from that, we also looked at how we could attribute the costs associated with treating those conditions. And that was very much directly from uh, the Ministry of Health uh, health tracker information, so the actual dollars spent by the health system. Um, and what was particularly interesting about that is those two uh, strands were done uh, separately, but actually produced very similar results. Uh, so that's um, uh, very positive because it suggests that by uh, improving outcomes, reducing the burden of disease, um, there will also be uh, treatment savings in the system. Of course, the challenge is uh, what those interventions should be and, and how much they might cost, which this study doesn't, um, doesn't look into. But at least it points the way to um, areas to focus on. Uh, so the first component of the results uh, was the prevalence of those adolescent risk factors. Um, as we mentioned, the childhood factors uh, broadly group themselves into uh, socioeconomic factors and interactions with care and protection, uh, police, family violence and the like. Um, and we'll come back to those in more detail. But when we looked across the adolescent risk factors, uh, the prevalence of having or the chance of having one of those uh, conditions is really pretty significant across the population as a whole. So we're really talking about the whole population here. So w basically how you can read this is about a quarter of um, people by the age of 25 will have experienced some uh, fairly significant mental health issues as we can see them through their system, use of system uh, supports. So whether it's mental health, uh, uh, prescriptions or services, community services or hospital services. Uh, and the same goes for approximately for um, both um, sort of nutrition related um, obesity issues and for uh, tobacco. Tobacco is about 16% um, and alcohol and other drug issues were about 7% uh, making up that 22. So the other thing that you'll notice obviously is that the sum of those numbers adds up to uh, more than 100%. Um, and this is because some people actually suffer from multiple conditions. So some people will have both issues with um, substance, well, in fact, comorbidity is pretty common with both um, uh, substance abuse and mental health, for example. So one of the key findings that actually hadn't been um, established in New Zealand before was that only a third of the population reaches age 25 without any of these uh, conditions. Um, so it, this is a really substantial population health issue, um, which is, I think, well understood um, in the sector. What we were then looking for in terms of going back in time was to see the extent to which we can discern differences in childhood experiences where there might be children who have a higher risk of developing these conditions or alternatively uh, a lower risk of developing these conditions. And we did see some fairly substantial differentiation. Um, and so we're going to put the results in, in, two, in two different ways. We're going to express it as a bit of a, an individual case study, an example, a bit of an um, um, illustrative example. Uh, and then I'll um, come back and speak to the, the whole of population uh, burden in terms of cost and um, dallies. So to speak to the individual example and some of those relativities, I'll hand over to Abby and I'll be back with you in a moment. <laughs> Thanks, Bridget. Uh, so just looking at it firstly from an what it might look like from an individual's perspective, um, if we think about the rainbow that um, Rosie showed a little bit earlier, uh, there's clearly a subset of the population that experience have shown signs of some areas of lower well-being. So in this example, um, we've looked at the very, the most acute end of that spectrum where we've got, in this example, a subset of teenagers who experience 
low socioeconomic circumstances, uh, extended low household income for most of their childhood, multiple hospitalizations, uh, contact with the care and protection system, and overall there are several areas where it looks like things aren't going quite so well. Um, and so when you look back at the IDI longitudinal data, and then also for the obesity factors, we looked at the health survey, there's an association between the accumulation of those factors and some of those development, some of those adolescent conditions that they develop later in life. So compared to other teenagers, we, ex we estimated that there is actually a disparity in the, an increase in the likelihood that they will develop these factors later in their adolescence. And so for example, we estimated two and a half times more likely to have that contact with mental health services uh, by the time they hit 25, three times more likely to smoke, seven times more likely to have substance usage treatment needs, uh, two and a half times more likely to have indicators of recurrent infections, and two times more likely to have nutrition and obesity related issues. And so all of that combines into a significantly higher risk that they are going to go on and experience actually poorer health over the duration of their adult lives. Um, and so if I'm going to, I'm going to skip briefly to the next slide. This is just another way of showing it, but basically the whole population, there is a, you know, a sort of general population prevalence of mental health treatment later in life, uh, smoking, uh, obesity, and that's what you see at the right hand of the graph. Um, but for children who experience multiple areas of lower well-being, those the likelihood that they will develop those conditions is a lot higher and so that's why as you go sort of more towards the left um the percentages increase and the disparity is greatest for substance usage treatment but it's there across all of the conditions and so for the for the child population with at least one of the adolescent risk factors we estimated an average nine uh, disability adjusted life years lost and that can be attributed to those adolescent risk factors so that's nine years of a healthy life lost uh, and then the excess cost per child we estimated about hundred and forty three thousand dollars but for kids who are at the very lowest end of the well-being spectrum it we would expect that to be substantially more so that's really putting the case that some of these factors that develop over childhood and adolescence have impact over the whole of life and it's quite substantial. Uh, so handing over to Bridget again. So then um, taking that up to the population level um, and, and looking at how we bring all of that together, um, what we did was um, effectively look at those childhood factors uh, and the extent to which they um, differentiated the development of the adolescent risk factors, with the, the big three uh, being those related to uh, mental health, substance use um, and um, obesity and nutrition. And at a population level, we were able to estimate uh, specifically the, the DALI's lost and the excess cost associated with those conditions. So in the burden of disease study, for example, there's overall, the system is, estimates there are a million years of healthy life being lost um, across the population. Uh, about all, the majority of those are actually lost in adult life, um, sort of 900,000. Of those, 53% are actually attributable to those major chronic disease conditions. And we estimated, and this was very much, as we say, a case study, so it was a first approximation, we estimated 40% of those could be attributed to experiences arising um, prior to age 25. Um, so there's a really, uh, you know, again, as Abby said, a, a strong case to say that a lot of this needs to be addressed earlier in the life course uh, and there will be major benefits from doing so. Uh, so overall for uh, the population as a whole, there were um, the 370,000 uh, DALIs lost that could be attributable to experiences before age 25. And that represents um, 5.6 
$1.5 billion of the approximately $15 billion spent uh, annually by, uh, on health in New Zealand. So a very significant proportion, um, which is, I think, hopefully points towards um, a lot of a lot of expense is um, obviously incurred uh, at that very acute end at the at the end of life, and that's clearly you know a major component of health system costs. But those chronic disease costs that last over many many years are becoming a greater share of our health systems cost, and um, and this points to being able to uh, work in those early years in public health um, responses to reduce that burden. Um, this is just a, another representation of, of, that, uh, of that impact. So that's all um, that we were going to cover today. So I think we are ready for the next presentation.